Pharmacology is the science of how medicines work and their effects on the body. Pharmacologists research, discover, and develop medicines, supporting their safe and effective use in patients. The British Pharmacological Society is a charity that promotes all types of pharmacology and their life-changing impact. We support pharmacologists around the world. The British Pharmacological Society. Today's science, tomorrow's medicines. Oh, louder than that. <laughs> so this is a digital and a real person Cheltenham event, and I'm so thrilled to see you all. My name's Vivian Parry. I'm a science writer and broadcaster and a long-time aficionado and devotee of everything Cheltenham. So thank you so much to all of you who've come here today you really get top marks for me. So let's tell you how this is going to work today. So um, we are live and we're online. Hello online. So you'll know online that actually this is the place to be next year. So um, you will all be able to submit questions because of we are in COVID times. It's going to be complicated, but you can do it, I know you can, because I know half of you are spooks from Cheltenham. So if you can do all that codes, you can sort this out, no problem. So um, we're using a platform called Slido, and uh, you're seeing a slide up there now about it. And uh, you can put in your question, and there will come a point when I will say, questions please, and we will take them, uh, as many as we can uh, get through. So, uh, you do it via the Q&A chat on your screen if you're online and submit your questions right through the event so that we can pull them all together at the end. Right, okay, so we are now talking about ageing well. Now, I know Cheltenham audiences age very well because they are really only 21, <laughs> all of them and uh, they are a very sprightly bunch. But we have two experts to talk about uh, ageing. We're talking about what happens biologically. We can talk practical steps for slowing it down. And here are our lovely panellists, Andrew and Lauren. Andrew, introduce yourself. I'm Andrew Steele. I'm a uh, former computational biologist, now a full-time science writer and presenter and that sort of stuff. And I've just released my first book, Ageless, The New Science of Getting Older Without Getting Old. And I'm Dr. Lauren Walker. I'm a consultant in a specialty called clinical pharmacology. So my specialty is medicines, the safe and effective use of medicines. And I have a particular research interest in the use of medicines as we age and develop more diseases and develop a, a situation where we, we might be having uh, polypharmacy, which is the use of multiple medicines. I'm also uh, I'm a general physician. I, I, I work in a, in a hospital in Liverpool um, and I'm a, uh, I help do test drugs, uh, new medicines in humans for the first time. So I'm a first in human clinical trialist. And I should say that if you're submitting questions, we can't take clinical questions. So not what dose should I take, please, Dr. <laughs> yes, Lauren. <afraid> not. <laughs> okay, so Andrew, tell us first of all, are we getting older, as in living longer, and how long has that been going on? Because we talk about, you know, times when the, uh, the oldest person was about 40. Was that true? And are we living longer? Well, yes, we are, actually. And if you look at the um, country in the world that has the highest life expectancy at any given moment in history, nothing really happened for literally thousands of years. So, you know, even if you go back to the Stone Age, things looked incredibly similar in terms of life expectancy right up to the beginning of, say, the Victorian period, when people were starting to move into, you know, densely packed factories and cities and that sort of stuff. And life expectancy, the headline, was about 30 or 35 years. So I think a lot of people think from that, oh, you know, if you made it to your 40s, you're incredibly lucky. 
But actually what this number does is it masks the incredible toll of childhood and infant mortality. And that means that actually you only had about a coin toss chance of making it out of your teens. And if you made it to the ripe old age of 20, you probably had a decent chance of living another 30 or 40 years. So, you know, it wouldn't be unusual to see 50 or 60, maybe even, you know, a handful of 70 and 80 year olds around. And we actually know that, you know, even going back much, much further in time, if you think about Roman emperors, some of them got to be, you know, incredibly ripe old ages. So it really is the case that that was, you know, that's how it was in the past. But since about the 1830s, we've been adding a quarter of a year every single year, so three months a year, to the life expectancy of the country with the highest life expectancy. And that's just been carrying on and on and on. And actually, it's a trend that doesn't seem to be reversing or slowing down. So, um, you know, I think you could do much worse in terms of projecting life expectancy into the future if nothing dramatic happens. And I rather hope it will. I guess we'll be talking about that later. But in the absence of anything dramatic, you know, you can be expecting to add three months of uh, life to yourself every year that you live. Or conversely, you know, maybe you don't think that a good night's sleep is time wasted because most of that is free time that you're going to get at the end of your life. And you've got a couple of slides to show. Yeah. So I think the most fundamental uh, way to understand ageing is to actually look at this graph. And I started out as a physicist. This graph is the reason I changed my career uh, to become a computational biologist. And you can see that along the bottom, you've got how old you are in years. And up the side, you've got your chance of death that year. And you know, everyone knows that as you get older, you're more likely to die. But how much just really shocked me. So let's show you the graph. You can see that there's this incredible increase in mortality. Let's just go through what that actually means. Um, when you are 10 year old, you've got your lowest chance of death throughout your whole life. And in fact, 10 year olds have a fascinating uh, crown, which is they are the safest humans in the history of our species. Unless you happen to be close to one. <laughs> <laughs> They've got a less than one in 10,000 chance of not making their 11th birthday. But sadly, it's all downhill or rather uphill from there. If you make it to 18, you've got a one in 3,000 chance of not making it to 19. Um, I'm in my 30s and I've got roughly a one in 1,000 chance of death, something like that. And think about that for a moment. If that were to continue for the rest of my life, I'd be pretty happy. I'd live into my thousand and thirties on average, but clearly that isn't what happens. Our risk of death doubles about every eight years. And what that means is that when you're 65, your odds of death are about 1% that year. When you're 80, your odds of death are about 5%. And if you make it into your nineties, if you're fortunate enough, that's way off the top of this graph here. Your odds of death in that, in any of those years are about one in six. So that's life and death at the roll of a dice. And you might be looking at this as a human and be, you know, this is terrifying. This is this exponential wall of mortality that's coming inevitably towards me. But as a scientist, you look at this and think, that's really fascinating because there's something that seems to cause all of our bodies to go wrong in quite a dramatic way very, very suddenly, exactly the same time in almost everybody's lives. And of course, you know, this is a graph of death. Death's nice and easy to measure. But actually what we're looking at is the chance of disease in any given year. So if you look at things like cancer or heart disease or stroke or dementia, all of these things follow basically a similar exponential trajectory with time. And so when we talk about, um, you know, treating or even curing aging, trying to do something about this aging process, then what we're really talking about is increasing your health span. So increasing the nice flat bit at the beginning of this graph where, you know, you're basically very unlikely to get any diseases and pushing that risk of disease and death further and further back, so staying healthier for longer, essentially. So we're definitely not talking immortality here. I do remember doing a film many, many years ago for Tomorrow's World when I interviewed some of those people who have their bodies frozen and think that they're going to be revived and defrosted when, you know, the right time. And at the time, I did think, and it's still true today, we ha don't even have the technology to defrost strawberries properly. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's not much, <laughs> not much at all. but in some ways they have a point because uh, in, uh, so their, their thing is always that by the time you unfreeze me, technology will have moved on. And actually that's very true because if you think about people who were born sort of during the, the wartime or so, shortly afterwards, they benefited from the big advances in uh, infant mortality, so they didn't die at birth, and then they survived to benefit from the big advances in, say, cardiac medicine. So, uh, Lauren, do you see that? You know, people who are really have become very relatively well, and we always say that, you know, 80 is the new 60. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. So I think, and, and it's interesting that you say about cardiovascular medicines, because medicines have so many potential benefits. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be here, I wouldn't do my specialty if it wasn't the case, but, and, and the cardiovascular 
reducing your cardiovascular risk is one of the kind of prime goals in life for what Andrew says about having a long health span, because that's got to be the ultimate goal. You want to live disease-free for as long as you can do, and, and in particular, avoiding heart attacks and strokes. Yeah, it's no good being ways. 120 if you're stuck in a chair. You yeah. want to be 120 and doing tango. And that's a really With important a, you know, point. A, a man of 70. <laughs> and, and that's really important because it's not just about... And I'm sure, um, it's not just about the avoidance of disease, anything that you can do to avoid disease, but there are other age-related phenomena that we also need to target. So the, the kind of the frailty, or what they call the geriatric syndromes, so the frailty syndromes, the reduced resilience that you had as you, as you age. So each time you suffer an illness event, it takes you longer to survive that or to get back to, or you may never get back to the previous kind of health that you had. Um, so, so that's a goal within itself. There's the age-related diseases, but the, the other goals of, of living better, uh, well for longer, uh, uh, that we see now, which is why we do see a lot more people in their, living to their 80s and, and being really well, is because they are living healthier lives for longer and that avoidance of disease. But the, the cardiovascular part in particular, the, the things like high blood pressure and high cholesterol, where we now have medicines that can target those things, that therefore reduce your risk of acquiring those things so people do live longer. And people always imagine that, you know, they, they can smoke and they can drink and they can eat and it'll all be marvellous because actually one day it'll be out like a light and that'll be absolutely marvellous. But it does, it's not like that because you may live with 10, 15, 20 years of disability. And what we want to give people is this lifespan yeah. where, they, uh, where it's a healthy lifespan. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that makes a lot of sense because I, I talk about death in my talks a lot, um, and that's because it's a cheery chat. It's phenomenally <laughs> easy to quantify. You know, it doesn't matter where in the world you are. If someone's dead, they're dead. If they're alive, they're alive. It's you know, very easy to do statistics. But when you look at things like diseases, you know, when does someone cross, cross the threshold into having a diagnosis? Are they so frail that we can diagnose them with what's called sarcopenia, which is a, you know, a, basically the age-related loss of muscle mass, or are they not quite at that threshold yet? You know, if they've got incontinence, is that actually something that you're going to target with a medication? That's a really, really tricky question to answer. It's much harder to quantify. But you know, in much the same way if we could draw a graph of those things then they too would be increasing exponentially with time and that's really what we want to be giving people as you know as we've all said this longer health span less time frail less time with diseases and less time dying i guess so what's the underlying biological process why do we age it's a whole collection of different things and there was a, a great paper that came out in 2013 that tried to sort of boil this down for the experts in the field it's now one of the most highly cited papers in aging biology called the hallmarks of aging and this broke it down to nine separate biological processes, which are kind of the fundamental cellular and molecular driving forces behind aging. And what's really key about these hallmarks is they aren't necessarily just responsible for a single disease. So it might be that one uh, type of hallmark accumulates and it makes you more likely to get maybe even all of the diseases of aging and the frailty and the you know, cognitive decline, all of this stuff at once just caused by a single biological process. And actually, uh, been, that, that paper came out in 2013. By the time I wrote my book, I've actually updated it, jiggled things around a bit, and ended up with 10. Uh, so these are things like damage to our DNA. So every day, you know, we're walking around doing whatever it is we do. Um, if you're a smoker, if you get exposure to UV light from the sun, that can directly damage your DNA. But actually, we think most of it just comes from the everyday rough and tumble of being inside a cell, because it's the instruction manual in the center of every one of our cells. Your cells are constantly dealing with sugar and oxygen, these high, highly reactive molecules that are what power us, you know, what allow us to be alive. And yet, unfortunately, the side effect is it can damage our DNA, it can damage that instruction manual. And that can go on to cause, most obviously, something like cancer, but also a variety of other aging-related diseases. Then there's other sort of bigger stuff. There's um, the cells in our body can get older, things called senescent, basically aged cells. And then uh, the sort of collection of these uh, more, perhaps more fundamental hallmarks. We're not entirely sure how to place them in a hierarchy. But then there are these sort of big dysfunctions of whole systems. And a really important one is the dysfunction in your immune system. And we've actually all had a fantastic, if sobering, example of that over the last sort of 12 or 14 months, which is that your risk of COVID, or rather your risk of death from COVID, looks just like that graph. In fact, it doubles slightly faster than your risk of death overall. Um, and if you catch COVID in your 80s, I mean, thankfully, most people in this country over 80 have been vaccinated now. But if it was pre-vaccination, you'd have been literally hundreds of times more likely to die than if I'd caught COVID. And so that, you know, that just shows you that your body's got less of that resilience that Lauren talked about the immune system's weaker so this collection of hallmarks just makes you weaker makes you at more risk of disease and death so the, one of the biggest hallmarks of aging is this thing inflammation and inflammation is associated with metabolic disease so diabetes with heart disease and i wonder lauren if you treat inflammation as you do by treating diabetes and all those other things does it make you live longer so yeah, so it's the, there isn't a simple answer to that question, but the, in some ways, yes. And, and, and 
uh, medicines that are used to dampen down the immune system and, and to reduce inflammation, the kind of the commonest ones that we would have all been exposed to are, are steroids, so things like prednisolone or most you know, famous at the moment, dexamethasone, which was revealed as, you know, and it, it helps um, people who have severe COVID for that reason, that it reduces the, immune, the inflammation that's associated with the damage to your, to your lungs. Um, so, and, and that, those steroids are based on something that's endogenous, that you yourself, that all of us produce the, the cortisol, but you can have too much of a good thing, unfortunately. And so exogenous steroids or taking in additional steroids where they'll give you a short term benefit for a particular condition. Unfortunately, you can't give people excess steroids for a long period because of the multitudinous problems. They, they, it weakens your bones, it causes diabetes, it, it causes a whole host of other autoimmune conditions because you kind of set the inflammatory balance out of kilter. So, and that's probably because it's a very upstream mediator. So by that, I mean, it dampens down inflammation everywhere. So there are moves for, and, and, and one of the, you know, one of the reasons that we all live longer with particular diseases now, particularly inflammatory diseases, things like rheumatoid arthritis and things like that, is because there are very specific medicines now that target very individual inflammatory markers to, that are implicated in that one individual disease. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so yes, the, sorry, I'm losing my voice. <coughs> yes is the answer to the question that you can reduce inflammation and that will extend people's lives who have those individual diseases. Whether that means that cohort as a whole lives longer because purely because of that drug or um, because having a disease means you are engaged in healthcare and often engaged in healthcare from quite a young age. And so one of the things we often wonder about is if I'm diagnosed with high blood pressure, for example, in my 30s, I, it could be the wake-up call I always needed and it means I change my life and I start to exercise and I have a plant-based diet and I do all the right things for me and I get my blood pressure under control but because I had that diagnosis I'm now known to my healthcare system I will be called every year for an annual checkup they will check that I haven't got diabetes as well they'll monitor my cholesterol and therefore maybe it's not because I, I took a particular inflammatory um, mediator all my life maybe it's because I was well looked after for that. And it, there's, there's, it's hard to extrapolate those two things and separate those things to say whether it was the medicines that you took or whether it was the, at what extent of it was the care that you had. So before we leave hallmarks of ageing, mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about a, another really interesting one, which is the microbiome. So your microbiome is the collection of bugs that live in and on you. And that has also been linked to a longer lifespan. It has, yeah. And in fact, that was the one I added for my book because in the, a few years since 2013, I'll say few, it's quite a long time now, isn't it? We're all getting older. Um, the, that's really, really emerged as a, a fascinating uh, field through which you can mediate ageing. And in fact, loads of other diseases as well. We've noticed that as you get older, your microbiome tends to get less diverse. So these, uh, you know, the bacteria and fungi and all these different organisms inside you tend to be more of a monoculture and they're often the more aggressive ones as well. We aren't entirely sure which exact species does what, and I think we're very, very rapidly learning more about it. I think the most compelling experiments have been done in animals. They've actually been done in a, a new, what's called model organism. So a model organism is where tr scientists try and simplify a problem. They find an organism that does something, you know, similarly to humans, but perhaps more quickly or more easily. And a great example of this is the turquoise killifish, which is this tiny little fish that lives in um, ephemeral ponds in Africa. These are ponds that when there's a rainy, the rainy season, the fish, you know, suddenly they've got water, they hatch, they go around, they mate, they die. This all happens over the course of a few months, which means if you want to study ageing in them, rather than waiting, you know, 70, 80, 90 years, maybe even longer if your experiment works, you can just sort this out very, very quickly. And what they did was they found that if they gave these killifish a microbiome transplant and the way they did this actually is just they gave some of the killifish a very strong antibiotic which killed all of the microbes in their gut and they let them share a tank with either young fish or old fish and because the fish well um, they, they um, what's the biological term for this it's called fecal transfer or something like that there's a bit of a euphemism but you can sort of see what it's coming at and what happens then food transplant yes yeah, <laughs> what happens then is that the the old fish can then either have a young microbiome or an old microbiome and they found that the fish that had the younger microbiome, they lived longer, and it's hard to you know, detect diseases in fish in exactly the same way we do with people, but they seem to dart around the tank more, they seem to be less frail in as much as a fish can be. So it really looks as though altering the microbiome can do stuff to ageing. There are some more, uh, more complicated and confusing experiments in mice, but there's definitely something going on, and I feel like it won't be too, too long before we're taking like, evidence-based probiotics, not this nonsense you see on the supermarket shelves at the moment. So I want to thinking of now, though, I mean, there are some people who've, who talk about having these transfusions of young blood kind of 
rather Dracula-like. Um, but it doesn't actually work. It doesn't stop it being sold, but it's, it, it doesn't actually work. Yeah. But what seems more promising are there are a lot of things called senolytic drugs. And senolytic drugs target not just diseases, but they target a process that causes aging. Do you want to pick that up first, Andrew? And let's come to Lauren to, to comment on it. Yeah, so the, the idea is that we, I, I mentioned in the hallmarks of aging, there's this one that's called the accumulation of senescent cells. And uh, although there's a bit of nuance, if you really want to dive into the biology, they're basically old cells. They're cells that have divided a lot of times. They're cells that might have a lot of damage to their DNA, which I mentioned. Um, and what that, what that means is that the cell thinks I've divided a lot of times. Maybe I'm dividing so many times because I'm a cancer, or maybe all that DNA damage put, puts me at risk of becoming a cancer. And so they stop dividing. And in, in youth, they're cleared away very efficiently by the immune system. But as we get older, we get more of them because we've got more DNA damage, our cells are divided more times, our immune system gets less effective at clearing them up, and so they accumulate in our bodies. And scientists have managed to develop drugs that can kill these senescent cells while leaving the rest of the cells in your body intact. And what that means is that, well, they, they gave them to mice, they gave them to mice that were 24 months old. And that's quite old for a mouse, that's about 17 human years, because they've got a much shorter lifespan than we have. And these mice, again, they basically get biologically younger. They, uh, they live a little bit longer, which I guess is a good thing, but they're not just living longer because it stops one particular disease. A lot of mice die of cancer, so it's not just you know, delaying their cancer and therefore they're frail, they're hobbling along, just sort of eking out a few more months. What they actually find is that they get less cancer, they get less heart disease, they get fewer cataracts. So it's got this effect across a whole load of different diseases. They're less frail, they can run further and faster on a tiny little mousy treadmill they use in these experiments. They're more curious, so if you pop them in a maze, they'll explore more in a way that's more reminiscent of a younger mouse. They even have better fur. And I said I'm a computational biologist, so I've never dealt with a, a, a mouse or a rat in real life, but even to my untrained eyes, these mice just look great. And so, you know, what you can see here is these senescent cells, they aren't just accelerating cancer, they aren't just accelerating heart disease, they're accelerating everything, including the frailty, you know, the wrinkles, the grey hair. And the idea is that by giving these drugs to people, we could potentially, you know, the, the dream would be to give them preventatively. So you might be 50, you might be 60, you've accumulated enough senescent cells that it's worth popping one of these things, clear out your senescent cells, and hopefully, you know, punt the frailty and stuff of old Now, age. I am sensing a big butt. <laughs> and it's written all over <laughs> Lauren's face. Lauren. So I, I completely agree with the excitement and the enthusiasm because I think, I think it offers an opportunity, Senolytics offer an opportunity to reduce not just age-related diseases, but you know, that health span idea, the idea of being less, it appeals to all of us to be less frail, to have better muscle mass, all those things to live well for longer. <clears throat> There's a few drawbacks at the moment and the reason that the science will take a, a bit longer to progress than any of us would hope is that obviously a mouse is not a human. Um, so we are much more complicated and particularly laboratory mice are very well protected. So um, what Andrew was saying is that quite, quite rightly senescent cell, the, the nature of senescence protects us from cancer. If, if you, you know, a big part of the problem for the development of a an, of an solid organ cancer, for example, is that you acquire so many defects and that the, the big hallmark is that that cell can survive, that becomes immortal and makes more, more and more copies of itself. Senescent cells don't do that. Um, so so their part of their job is to stop you being able to have one of those malignant cells that, re that replicates and spreads around the body. So they, they have a purpose. The bit that has less of a purpose is the, the old senescent cells, the ones that develop something called a, a SASP phenotype, which means that they are inflammatory, they release some inflammatory mediators. Those are the ones you really want rid of um, because the, those, are the, those are the ones that we think are, the are kind of at the nidus of the problem. Um, and so, but but we, we mustn't forget that senescence has a purpose and mice in laboratories are not exposed to the same amount of you. They, they don't lie on sun lounges and they probably don't smoke and things like that. So they are less challenged than we are as a complex biological organism. But the challenge, so, so you don't want to take something out upstream where you take out all these cells that are becoming senescent because they are useful to you. Those are the ones that are taking out the potentially cancerous cells. What you want is something very, very sensitive and specific that takes out those inflammatory SASP senescent cells that are in the circulation that are the drivers for, for those age-related diseases. But what I would argue is what, what, what hampers our development of these kinds of medicines is how can you sensitively and specifically say those of the cells that I've taken out of the system and have left the others alone. 
and that's a little bit tricky. There are markers of being able to do that within, within you know, that people look at within clinical trials, but, but we're not quite there yet. And some of that requires the understanding of how we develop new medicines. So when you, the first stage of any new medicine, if you came to me with an idea for a new medicine to treat a particular disease, is that the first bit we have to do is get the dose right and make sure that the drug is safe. Before we ever talk about whether or not it works, you have to make sure it's safe and it doesn't make people more unwell. So the more ill you, the, the, the worse the disease is, the more kind of toxicity you accept from the drug, which is why often in cancer drug trials, people do often get quite unwell, but that's because they're unwell anyway, and, and you've got to take out... So the risks outweigh the benefits. Yeah, and you, and you kind of have to accept your, your, your tolerance for risk is very different in a cancer trial. But if you're developing a drug to treat ageing, you really, you know, when you think about consenting somebody to take part in that trial, you're going to have to give them, you're going to have to say to them, I'm going to give you a medicine that we hope will prevent ageing. Um, but by the way, it might make you get cancer. And, and so your tolerance for risk would yes. be really, really low because, so, so there is there are some nuances there. So it's not to say that it can't be done, um, but, but there are challenges you need. I'm just to going to ask our audience to put up their hands if they would be prepared to be in a trial for an anti-ageing drug. Madam, you don't look old enough. <laughs> drug. So we've only got one here, people at home. So it's, uh, it's funny, isn't it? Because on the one hand, there is an extraordinary industry, anti-aging industry, and yet these sensible folk, there's only one person who was a bit tentative <laughs> about putting up her hand, who doesn't need it anyway. So, yeah, I think it's going to be a really fascinating problem, to be honest, because I'm... I'm very cautious. I don't take anything. I often get asked this, you know, do you take any particular supplements or this or that? And I, I don't. Um, but I think, you know, as I get older and as the improvement, we get more and more robust evidence, there will come a point where doing nothing is riskier than doing something, even though doing something might carry some kind of, un, you know, uncertainty or risk. There's going to be a point where, you know, for, to, take, to take one example, there's a drug called metformin. And actually, this is a, a diabetes drug, right? And it's a drug that, um, we, we, so there was a trial, it was actually a retrospective trial, so it was looking back at medical records of people in the UK. And they found that people who were diabetic who were taking, taking metformin, the primary purpose of the study was to work out whether they were, um, whether metformin was a better diabetes drug than some, another class called sulfonylureas. And that, uh, that worked basically, metformin did indeed, you know, make patients live longer and healthier. However, they also included a control group, and this was people who weren't diabetic and therefore weren't taking metformin. And what they found was the diabetics who take metformin actually live longer than the non-diabetics, even though the non-diabetics are healthier, they you know, tend to be less overweight, that kind of thing, and they're not taking the metformin. So that's a suggestive thing. The problem is, exactly as Lauren said, you know, these people who are diabetics, maybe they're just getting an incredibly good interaction with the healthcare system, whereas all the non-diabetics just never go to their doctor, don't realise all the problems they've got, so maybe that's what's driving it. We've also got some evidence in animals, you know, we can look at what the metformin does in a mouse, or we can look at what the metformin does in cells in a dish. The evidence is really strong enough that what we need is the gold standard, what's called a randomised controlled trial, where we get a bunch of people, and actually this is being undertaken in the States, which you already have started, but it was delayed due to COVID. We get a bunch of people who are older, and then, you know, give them some of this metformin, give other other half uh, a placebo, so that's why it's a controlled trial, because these people are getting a drug that doesn't do anything. And then we can watch them for a number of years and see who gets ill first, who dies first. And by this composite indicator, we can start to measure ageing. And it's a really fascinating thing, because until you've got this randomised controlled trial, there's, you know, part of you thinks, until I've got that gold standard of evidence, you know, maybe I even need a systematic review, I need to have loads of randomised trials, I need to pull them all together, it's got to be in different populations, etc, etc, before we can really, really be absolutely sure. And yet, you know, well, there does come a point where, you know, maybe you're 50 and you might be thinking I should maybe start taking this because although there is obviously a risk associated with it, I'm not advocating this and I'm not even the right no, no. kind of doctor to be giving medical advice, so let's not talk about that. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's really fascinating trying to weigh up these pros and cons and trying as a scientific and a medical community to give people the information that they need in order to, you know, give informed consent for these kinds of things. Because I think, you know, it, there's, there's a danger of being overcautious, but there's also a danger in someone like me, who's not a practicing doctor, to say we're being overcautious and us like throwing caution to the wind and handing out pills to everybody. And I think it's a genuinely tough problem to, you know, because I think there are quite a lot of people, there, there are these people called biohackers, they call themselves, who, you know, doing all kinds of mad things. There's one woman who's a CEO of a uh, biotech company who went to Colombia and got herself telomerase gene therapy to extend some bits of her DNA called her telomeres, which are thought to be implicated in aging. That's never been shown to work in humans. I, it, it, I mean, and all the data, because it's just, the, just her. And would and she ever tell you if it didn't work? Well, exactly. It's just, it's a fascinating thing. So yeah. that's sort of one end of the spectrum. But if people are going to experiment, we should do it as a proper trial and get data from them. Because if they're going to do it any Anyway, I want to know if these things work. So we're going to take some questions from the uh, audience now. So somebody's going to scamper on in a moment and give me some questions that they've collected through uh, Slido from you all. 
Lauren, is there a drug that exists already, you know, uh, uh, Andrew's talked about metformin, that you think might have the same kind of effect? It's different. I think metformin is it's within the TAME trial, isn't it? The big tri trial in the States. And met metformin is probably the most kind of infamous example of, of what you might do for its... Uh, and probably a lot of it is related to a, a kind of off-target anti-inflammatory effect that it may well have, rather than the, the kind of glucose... Off-target? Yeah. What do you mean by off-target? So target? meaning that it's not... What, so the way that metformin works is it, it reduces the amount of sugar that your liver produces. So it makes you, that's how it drops your sugar levels. So that's its target, but there are other, thing, other places that it will target, other things that it might do. So the immunity might be a way that it, so it wasn't what it was designed to do, but you identify that. So statins are very similar. Target is to reduce cholesterol biosynthesis within your liver, but they have what we call pleiotropic effects. They, they are anti-inflammatory within themselves, which is another argument that you might say, well, actually being on a statin, maybe statins really are the reason that our life expectancy keeps going up every year, not just because it reduces our cholesterol, but it reduces the amount of inflammation within your vessels, within your blood vessels makes you less likely to have a heart attack and a stroke. So, so metformin joins a select little band of drugs like aspirin, uh, that, um, like uh, statins, that actually have much bigger effects than we ever thought right yeah. at the beginning. Yeah, and it's that sort of, and that's where you, when you start to think about polypharmacy, how you know, we mustn't think that all polypharmacy is bad. There's a lot in the, in the media at the moment about this idea that, you know, too people are taking too many medicines, there's too much wasted medicines. Some, people's some people can take 10 medicines and they're all entirely appropriate and they're safe and they've been well reviewed. Um, and, uh, you know, somebody like me who, my, medicines is my, is, is my specialty, I, I might look at those and say they are all appropriate, they're not interacting with each other, they're not causing problems, you're safe on that, but I want to see you in a year from now and two years from now and three years from now. Because as you get older, the way that you process medicines changes, your, your kidneys shrink, your liver, the blood flow to your liver changes, your, your, your mu water to muscle balance changes. So, that's the important part about a lot of these medicines that are, we've got years of experience with them. If you just take statins, metformin and aspirin, the examples you used, you have long-term experience with them. We know what the risks are related to them. We know what the benefits are, but it requires regular scrutiny because 10 years from now, my body will be very different to, you know, 30 years from now or 40 years from now, that we, we have to be mindful of the impact that the way that your body changes and how that effect affects your drugs, because new drugs are tested in young, fit, healthy, usually men, you know, they're a very restricted population of people. And then we go out and give them to people that are in their 80s who take 10, 15 different medicines. And, and that's when it becomes a problem. So I don't know where the questions have gone, but they've kind of disappeared into a Slido pit. But I've got plenty, so that's all right. Um, we've talked about some of the processes. How about some of the practical things we can do to age well? And Andrew, let's start with you. You already mentioned exercise. And um, there's a very interesting way of telling how fit, well, not how fit, but how well people are with the speed of their walking, isn't there? Yeah, and in fact, so there's, um, there's a huge drive within ageing, generally the biology of ageing, to try and come up with what are called biomarkers of ageing. So that's things that can basically tell how biologically old you are rather than how, um, you know, chronologically old you are, how, how, what, you know, what it says in your birth certificate. And actually, walking speed is a really good one. Another really good one is grip strength. And it's really interesting because you can sort of see them as a gold standard to which other more complicated sounding biomarkers have to live up to. So, for example, there's a lot of excitement in biogerontology, the uh, biology of aging at the moment, about something called an epigenetic clock, which looks at various markers on your DNA and can determine how old you are very precisely. But the question is, you know, is it better than grip strength or walking speed, which at the end of the day are much, much simpler tests. You don't have to have a blood uh, sample drawn, you don't have to go off and you know, try and do some sequencing or try and do some, uh, you know, d d d have to look at the DNA at all. So yeah, it's really fascinating how really basic stuff, like even how old you look is a predictor of how long you're, you've got left to live. So there's some really, really simple, quite intuitive measures which do sort of um, morbidly well. And getting up and down out of your chair without using the armrests is, is a good one yes. as well. So how, how many times you can do it without... Standing on one leg? Yeah, that's uh, called by doctors the timed unipedal stance test to try and make it sound a bit more technical. But... <laughs> more high tech. <laughs> that's a really, really good thing to do is to practice standing on one leg. I do it quite often. Yeah. <laughs> so does my mum. Yeah. So let me ask some of the questions which we've now uh, got. Uh, and this is a really good question. What are the implications for our planet, the environment, the world's resources and population levels, if we're significantly increasing average lifespan? 
should we be worried? Should we be just knocking you all off? <laughs> well, we'd always, it would always be an older age, isn't it? And it would be older than the politician who is deciding the, pol the policy, <laughs> I would suggest. <laughs> I'm going to give two answers to that question. One of them very practical and quite specific to the population question, because it's definitely the question that I get asked most often, actually more often than I get asked about the science of, you know, how is it that I can live longer or what drugs are available or that sort of stuff. The practical answer is that actually it doesn't make as big a difference to population as you think. So even if we literally cured death in 2025, and I would argue that's an optimistic target, because that requires not only do we eradicate ageing, we also eradicate, you know, infectious disease, we don't ever get hit by a bus again, etc, etc. And we roll that out, we don't just develop those medicines, but roll them out globally within the next sort of four or five years. Then by 2050, currently our population is approaching 8 billion. The UN's medium variant, so their sort of best projection of what we think is going to happen to the population, is 9.8 billion by 2050. And if we literally cure death in 2025, the population will be about 11.7 billion. Now that is about a 20% increase, it's not nothing, but, and it, but all that means is that to solve problems like climate change, you're going to have to work 20% harder. As I say, that's not nothing, but you've then got to look at the other side of the balance sheet, and that's how I, um, that's sort of the second answer to this question. It's an answer to a lot of the ethical questions relating to treating ageing. Ageing is the single largest humanitarian challenge of our time, is the case I make in my book, and that might sound like a slightly counterintuitive thing to say, but if you look at the 150,000 people who die every day on planet Earth, more than 100,000 of them die because of ageing. So that's more than two thirds of deaths are caused by things like cancer and heart disease and Alzheimer's, all of these things, which as you saw from that graph, you know, you can smoke, you can ex fail to exercise your way to some of these things coming a bit sooner, but getting old is the one thing that's inescapable. So, or at least at the moment, is inescapable. And so on that side of the balance sheet, you've got this huge cause of death. We've already talked about the things that aren't necessarily diseases or causes of death, that cause huge amounts of suffering, the frailty, the cognitive impairment, the hearing loss, the sight loss, the incontinence, the impotence, this whole sort of catalog oh, of different stop conditions. stop it. Just <laughs> stop it. So that's why I characterise this as this enormous humanitarian challenge. And so, you know, if, if we could solve that, if we could literally cure that, and I know that's a bold thing to aim for, then I'd happily work 20% harder, you know, reducing my carbon footprint and watching what I eat a bit more. Frankly, we could solve a lot of the problem just by eating less meat. So I think that, you know, when you weigh it up in that way and sort of to reverse the question, if we had an overpopulation problem, would you invent ageing to solve it? Would you get, you know, people who are living incredibly long, healthy lives and impose upon them decades of degeneration and suffering before dying of something unpleasant? I really don't think I would. And I think if you wouldn't answer yes to that question, then you shouldn't answer yes to should we ban research on something that's going to extend healthy life. So what's interesting, Lauren, of course, is that on the one hand, uh, if you can increase healthy lifespan, people can go on working for longer and be productive. And at the other end of the scale, we're having a population decline because people are having less uh, uh, children every year, every, all throughout the uh, developed world. So you could argue that actually being healthier for longer is a good. Absolutely, it's, it's the ultimate goal, but it's just not losing sight of the fact that health span is, that is, has to be the goal. And I think you can't take the societal aspect out of it either, in the sense that for some people, health span, having a longer health span is just not achievable because they live in poverty because of the health inequality across the UK. You know, if you live in the north of the country, you're likely to die about 10 years younger than if you live in a, in a wealthier uh, part, part of the other half of the country. Uh, there are parts of some cities where there's a 10 year discrepancy and for health span it's even worse. So in some of the more deprived northern parts of the country, you can expect to have a health span up to around age 52, meaning that you'll kind of get your first long term condition around that age, whereas in, in wealthier parts of the country, that's about two decades later, maybe you're you know, late 60s, early 70s. So for the people who are living healthier for longer, I completely agree their ability to contribute in terms of working and, 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 and be carers responsibilities and bringing up children and, and helping older frailer um, members of the community definitely but if we have lots of people who are who are becoming unwell and becoming physiologically older than they are chronologically older in their 50s that's a huge challenge that in my view we have to try to sol solve first because it's a real problem. The more long-term conditions you develop as you're in, if you're younger, the more likely you are to take many different medicines, the more likely you are to end up in hospital as a result of those And of course that's hugely on. costly, both yes. to the uh, economy. And actually it, it takes away money that you might put into education, for example. Absolutely, yeah. And that, that's the kind of societal cost that we have to balance. If you end up in a, in a hospital and then you 
fall out of bed and you break your hip and you then end up in a care home, for example. All those kinds of things, the carer's responsibility, because if we all live longer, then our parents will live longer. And it's always having somebody to care for. We have to be mindful of that, that that has a, uh, has a cost in itself. I think I'm going to disagree slightly. I often have a ding dong with social scientists about this because there is definitely enormous health inequality both within the UK and internationally. Mm -hmm. But actually, global life expectancy is seven, or was 72.6 years in 2019, which is the most recent year we've got data for. That means most people in most countries are living long enough to experience the decline of ageing. And actually, I'd love to see you know, health programmes that try and enable people who are from poorer backgrounds to live longer and live healthier. But actually, having an anti-ageing drug in our back pocket that actually did reverse or reverse biological age, as Lauren says, a lot of these problems that happen, if it's caused by smoking, if it's caused by lack of access to good food, you know, not having time to exercise, all of these different things, they effectively accelerate the ageing process. And while I'm not proposing you know, medicalising everybody, having a pharmacological tool that we could then give to people that would increase their health span, um, I just think that's a win-win. It means that we can you know, tackle it from both a social policy point of view and a medical one. So I think we should, not rather than doing one first then the other, we should just do all of it as fast as possible and let's make the world great. And actually one of our uh, audience members, we've got a good question here, is, um, which, which comes into this, which is, um, should medicine focus on maximising healthy life for the population rather than extending life expectancy? I don't think those two things are in conflict at all. And I think there's a, there's a sort of, it's a misconception, basically. You, know, you imagine if you take a drug that's going to make you live longer, then you're you know, perhaps in the worst case scenario, we all live to 120, but we spend our last 40 years in a nursing home incontinent and unable to move. That'd be awful. Like, nobody wants that. Scientists don't want that. Who would be doing that research? The fact is that you have, when you die, you have to die of something. And that means that if you're ill, that's what's going to make you die. So that means that you're, in order to make people live longer, you have to extend their health span. It's, it'll be, I, I, I just can't imagine an intervention that would somehow, like, this incredible laser-targeted intervention to the hallmarks of ageing, that would somehow allow you to sort of stagger on in frailty without stopping you getting frail and without stopping you getting ill, and then, you know, to live these incredibly long lives. So I think that's something that's really, really important to emphasise. It's, it's, I think it would be you know, ridiculously scientifically difficult to come up with a medicine that did that. And therefore, you know, one very much comes in tandem with the other. But it is interesting, isn't it, Lauren, that we tend to, the way we look at medicine at the moment is we treat particular diseases. We don't treat the whole person. And when people die on the death certificate, is it possible for doctors to write old age or do they have to write yeah, you something? Can, yeah, you can. You, you, you can. It is acceptable to do that once you're kind of, I think, presumably over 80, I would, I would say. Um, so you, and you can, you can die from a confluence of different age-related disorders and the kind of lack of resilience that you have to recover. Um, the only, I guess my life is injecting a note of caution into everything. So I don't disagree, actually. I think the two things don't have to be mutually exclusive, but you do have to remember that when you come to design these trials, that's always going to be the challenge. So if you imagine the big metformin trial looking at, does, you know, does metformin prevent the acquisition of age-related diseases? Well, if you were going to design that trial, would you, would you start with people who have disease? Probably not. You would probably, or you might start with people who have one disease. So you may say, okay, well, we'll go for everybody that's over 65 who've got one disease. We'll follow them all up forward. And in a decade's time, we'll see are the people that are taking metformin only st still only have one disease, you know, compared to the people that are taking the placebo. Maybe that's how you will do it. Um, and is 65 the right age point that you choose? Do you choose 75? Do you choose 55? Because I would say that there are parts of the country where you couldn't, you couldn't choose 55 because too many of those people have too many conditions that are related to unhealthy lifestyles, for example. So, so it's, it, it, it's, it's how you will design the trial. If you're going to design a trial to prevent the acquisition of age-related diseases, you've probably got to pick diseases for which there isn't already a condition. So quite often senolytics are done for the um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or primary sclerosis and cholangitis, which are conditions that have no real treatment and they are really debilitating and they make people very unwell and very frail and, and, and die early. So, so again, it's like what I was saying before, your kind of tolerance for risk will be a little bit higher because they have no other alternative. But if you, if you wanted me to design a trial to prevent age-related diseases of a brand new senolytic medicine, I would feel uh, more uncomfortable about who is my patient group because we're already too restrictive in how we develop new medicines. They don't really represent the group of people that end up taking the medicines. And that's the note of caution is older people take many medicines. That's how we live 
one of the reasons we live as long as we do and therefore the potential to interact because one of the problems with analytics is that they're taking out a particular cell but if they have off-target effects where they take out other cells um, or panlytic where they take out some of your bone marrow producing cells you're more likely to bleed you're more likely to get infection if you're already taking other medicines that increase your likelihood of those things like a blood thinner because you've got a, an irregular heart rhythm then your your potential for risk is much higher so we just have to be mindful that these medicines are going to be taken by the population that have the most numerous diseases and take the most medicines and if we're not doing that if we're des deliberately designing these drugs to treat people who don't who are older and physiologically really fit and well and still go skiing every year at 80 then we're introducing a health inequality because we are designing a drug for people who have already had a really good life I'm going to give them more of a good life and we also have to make sure that if people take senolytic drugs it's not like some people do with uh, statins where they say I'm on statins I can have two pies now not one <laughs> yes and people do do that yes I have come across I'm sure you all know people who do yeah. that yeah <laughs> who, who think that it's a it's an opportunity to uh, just in overindulge <laughs> without any worries um, a, a quick question for uh, you Andrew Inflammation is a key driver of ageing and autoimmune conditions. Could ageing research lead to breakthroughs and treatments for autoimmune conditions too? Really interesting it question. Could, and it's more complicated than it at first seems. I, I was, I, the, the, so the link between ageing and autoimmunity, actually the peak age for diagnosis of an autoimmune condition, I think is late 40s, early 50s. I might have got that slightly wrong one way or the other, but it's not, you know, it's, it's not, they don't increase with that exponential pattern that you see. And it's quite possibly because our immune system declines in efficiency with age. Maybe that's an oversimplification, we're not really quite sure. I think one of the things that I'm most excited about, which is also quite wild and out there, which might have an application in this exact niche, is the idea of a, an, an immune system reboot. And so that this is something that we actually already do for patients with cancer, effectively, that isn't what we call that. We call it just a, a bone marrow transplant or a, a blood stem cell transplant. And the idea is that you give them chemo or radiotherapy and kill all of the stem cells that produce the blood cells in their bone marrow. And for a patient with cancer, that's because those stem cells have become cancerous and they're churning out leukemic cells or something, and that's what's causing the disease. But then what you have to do is give them some stem cells, otherwise they'll just die of you know, not having any blood in a few days' time. So you give them this transplant of stem cells, and this is something we've been doing for decades and decades. What we found in the last few decades is that you can actually use this as a treatment for autoimmune disease. And it's, it's quite a last line treatment. It's not something, you know, you wouldn't just walk in and go, oh, I've got a few symptoms of something autoimmune. They're like, right, let's rip out your bone marrow. But it's the sort of thing that's given to people with very, very severe multiple sclerosis, for example. And what you can do is you can put the, uh, put, you know, get rid of all their immune cells and then add this, these new stem cells. And it seems to sort of reset the immune system. I think the best way to think about this is if you look at twins, so they're biologically identical, so identical twins, only about, if, if one twin has MS, there's only about a 30% chance the other one will. Now that's only sort of in inverted commas, that's still a, you know, quite a big chance. But it does show you that there's probably something about how the immune system develops that's just sort of luck based as to whether you actually go on to develop the disease. And so by clearing out your whole immune system and effectively starting again from zero, it's actually the most effective, albeit as I say, quite uh, sort of severe treatment for MS that we have now. And so I'm hopeful that, you know, maybe in some years' time, we've managed to, particularly the chemo and the radiotherapy, a grueling, grueling, nasty treatments. And then in the weeks that follow that, you are incredibly susceptible to infection before your immune system's rebuilt itself. But if we can work out a way to make that process less grueling, there's actually some evidence that refreshing the immune system in this way could get rid of some of the inflammation and some of the problems with the immune system that are associated with ageing too. But whoever asked that question, uh, it's what I think is really interesting is that the things that we discover doing research on one thing that leads to something else altogether is absolutely not to be underestimated. I mean, we've discovered all sorts of things. For instance, it used to be thought that there was no uh, renewal of uh, cells in the brain, that we couldn't learn new things, all those things about, you know, not being able to teach old dog new tricks. And <laughs> but it turns out that actually we're much, much more able to replace ourselves than actually anybody ever thought and that came from research in really a quite different area yeah and it's just i mean it's really challenging because you don't want to get a bunch of people over the age of 60 and start slurping out their brains to look for stem cells so you can imagine why it's that we didn't find that out before i'm yeah. sure anybody here would volunteer <laughs> i need all of these <laughs> i'm using them so we've got a, just a little time left and what i wanted to ask each of you to do is to give me your top five tips so we'll we'll start with you we'll do them one at a time and i imagine lauren that you would be keen to say review your medicines regularly 
Yeah, so is this just sort of for ageing well? For ageing yeah, well. definitely. Um, yeah, I, I would say scrutinising the medicines you're on, but also thinking about what, what's important to you and what you value into, with regards to your medicines. For some people, they value... Um, well, you know, from some of my older patients in clinic, they will say, do you know what, I just want to get to my daughter's wedding next year. I just want to be well and I want to get there and that's what I want to do. And after that, I'm not, you know, not really bothered. So they have a timed sort of thing that they're interested in. Whereas some people say, I just want to live healthy for as long as I can. And then if I'm not healthy anymore, I wouldn't be that bothered. And so that so those people might say to me, so you can stop my blood pressure medicines then and you can stop my cholesterol medicine then. Because after that, you know, if I'm, if I'm frail, I don't want to take them. So it's reviewing your medicines and thinking about what matters to you and what's important, what you want to get out of the medicines that you take. Because you don't have to take all the medicines that mm. you are offered. And very often with older people, you get this polypharmacy, as it's called, where yeah. actually you get some drug interactions and it's a bit like a, you know, an iceberg. You, know, you get more yeah. and more drugs added. And like my mother did, just say, oh, I'll have the blue ones today. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, your tip. Uh, two. I two. Made, I've done five. And I'll, I'll, in that case, I'll do. Okay, start one, and then we'll get to one. <laughs> so, um, number one, don't smoke. It's just so bad. I'm sure that you know this already. It's just so incredibly bad for your health. Make sure you so much faster. Don't do it. That's right. One. Lauren. Regular exercise. I might have nicked that. Yeah, you nicked that. Yes. Um, yeah, you can so share it. Yeah, we'll share that one. So, yeah, keeping your muscles strong, I think, is a really important thing. And, you know, important for the medicines that you take as well. You know, uh, good muscle masses. And, and interesting grip strength. Increasing yeah. your grip Keep strength. Just by doing a, you know, with a gripping thing. Yeah. Can actually also lower your blood pressure, which yes. is yeah. uh, extraordinary. Yeah, strength, you. strength training, big one. Brush your teeth. Um, it's actually been noted by, um, we, now we understand more about the biology of ageing. You can see that the sort of war in your mouth between uh, the bacteria that cause gum disease and the bacteria that cause tooth decay in your immune system. As you know from visits to the dentist, that's a war that can never be won. They end up just drilling out bits of your tooth in this sort of incredibly stone age practice, frankly, in the 21st century. So by having better oral health, by keeping your teeth clean, by flossing, by using incidental brushes to get all the nonsense out from between your teeth every night, you can actually reduce the overall burden of inflammation in your body, reduce your risk of heart disease, maybe even reduce your risk of dementia. So that's an unconventional bit of health advice that understanding ageing biology helps you achieve. Absolutely, that's brilliant. Um, you know, have a plant-based diet, definitely, um, you know, for innumerable reasons, but I've been doing a high blood pressure clinic for 15 years and I have never met a vegan in my clinic. <laughs> So there you go. Study N equals one. Yes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've, I've never come across somebody who has a plant-based diet in a high blood pressure clinic in 15 years. So. Uh, Andrew, one for you now, but well, it, are there some social things? Because one of the things that we've seen is that having a big network of friends, having social contact is something that is really important in terms of It definitely of is. I think it's very hard to quantify, um, but things like having more social contact and being less stressed can increase the length of your telomeres, which I mentioned earlier, these sort of markers on the end of your DNA. We really haven't got a great particular specific piece of health advice. If we're talking about social things, I'm very conscious of yeah, yeah. very short on time. Shush. The most important thing is to campaign. Tell everyone about this amazing science, because it's not understood by biologists, by doctors, by policymakers. I want everyone to be talking about this. That's why I wrote the book. That's my which book. is available for anyone who'd like to buy a copy at the tent. <laughs> what a what a what a wonder! I'll so we've reached the end. So online viewers, thank you so much for joining us, and we do hope that you'll be with us again next year in person. To our lovely Cheltenham audience, God, I love you. It's it, it's so special to be back with you all, and thank you so much uh, for coming. It's been wonderful, and to Lauren and to Andrew, thank you for being uh, such wonderful contributors and guests today. Thank you so much.